Hello. Um, thanks for coming to this talk. Also, it's the last last slot of the day. I know beer is coming soon. Um, so thank you for coming uh, and, and joining me here. So let's process more guidance with the team playbook. Um, who actually have heard of the Atlassian team playbook here? No one. All right. Um, so um, you probably, if you, if you haven't heard, no problem. Um, but you probably also, oh, two over up there. Yeah, um, great. Um, so you probably uh, have maybe experienced some play from the place from the playbook. Um, because it's just a it's a, just a couple of of, of methods that we do um, each day or at, at at specific things at when when our project runs into a wall or something. Um, so for example, like 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 standups, that's a play in the team playbook. Um, so my name is Sven. Um, I work for for a company called K15T Software. Um, you might think, what, what, what is, what, why, why is he talking about the Atlassian team playbook? Um, so I've been working for Atlassian for seven years and recently joined uh, K15T Software, which is a partner of Atlassian in Germany. Anyway, um, but my story actually starts way before that. Um, back in 1999, when I was a young student, uh, recently graduated from, from university, I was eager to write some software. So I had a lecture in university called software engineering. And what they teach me, how we approach software development, how do we run projects in software development, goes like this. It's the waterfall, pro waterfall uh, methodology, right? Um, you know, uh, waterfall is the thing to do. That's what they told us. We ran into, into the uh, organizations and said, yeah, so we have to write down the requirements. We have to do some coding, then uh, have to do the testing, and then show it to the customer. And if it doesn't work, well, we go back and adjust the requirements. This was the way to go. We all know that this was a, a real failure. Um, it, it, developing software like this really uh, was very, very frustrating because at that time, 40% of all software projects got killed, so never saw actually any, any customer. Um, so, uh, and also, the, the software developing this way was very frustrating for software developers. Deadline was were, were just... just uh, Shift, shift it out and stuff like that. So very, very frustrating for me. Um, but fast forward, actually, um, in 2004, I came in contact with, with something called Agile at that time. And I was totally fascinated and say, oh, wow, this sounds great, Agile, what is it? Um, especially uh, people told me, well, if you have problems, you have to do Scrum. And Scrum was so great. Scrum was, it, it was really eye-opening. I mean, Totally. They told me, you can run short, short iterations, short cycles, just two weeks or three weeks, and then, then you can show your result to the customer and adjust things. It's not like you have to, have to go down the whole waterfall. It's great. It's so great. And everything went transparent. We had the scrum boards where we could see what, what people were doing in my team. I really, I really loved scrum at that time. It was really, really the unicorn. Well, but then actually people said, okay, scrum, scrum is great, but maybe it doesn't fit fix uh, all our problems. Um, so we need something that is way more faster. So why, why, why would we use Kanban for that? Or people use the enterprise unified process to scale Scrum. Or people were using Spotify's qualification um, and found out that they are not working like Spotify. So uh, ditch that again, uh, or the scaled agile framework. But this was just, this, this is just a few uh, variants of agile. Uh, coming to life. There are much, much, much more variants of Agile. And of course, yeah, um, there's, there's a lot of stuff to pick from. What, what, what methodology should you choose? 18, 18 years after the Agile manifesto has been written, right? Um, what, what should you choose? What should you pick? Well, all these methodologies are for specific situations, for specific teams, for specific kind of organization for specific projects. Everything has a fit. Every, everyone just adjusted Agile a little bit to their needs uh, and, and said, this is the new methodology. Um, and people were just copying it. Well, so what now? Let's go back to the heart of, of actually Agile. What is Agile about? Agile is about rapidly changing stuff. So if we see there's a flaw or there's, there's, there's something that doesn't work, we change it. That's, that's agile, reacting to change, being, being agile. What do we need for that? We need, to, we need to empower our teams. 
our teams need to have the, the right power to change stuff. They need to be enabled to change stuff. Um, they, they, it's, it's not like we have to change something, but we have to go up the hierarchy and ask the manager's manager if we can do that. That's not agile. The team needs to be empowered. This is one thing. The other thing is, if, if the team is empowered, we need the right people in those teams. We need the right team structure. Not back in the days where actually we worked in these, in these silos, where the developers working in their silos, the IT folks working in their silos, and the QA department there. And we were just throwing, throwing stuff over the wall. That is, this times are over. Clear roles. Today, we'll, we're, we're working in cross-functional teams, much closer together. We need to understand the whole process as a whole, you know? We need to understand the designers. If we need to change something in the design, we need a designer in the team to, to make those changes. Um, if we need something more, if, if we see there's something with security, maybe we need some, some IT person that helps us with that. So we, we really love uh, cross-functional teams uh, and, and we, we use that at Atlassian. So we, have, we, we always say, you build it, you own it from end to end. So you come up with the idea, you, 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 you write your user stories, and you run the systems. So you own it from end to end. Um, but that said, also teams are different. So if you look at, there are some teams that uh, may be quite organized, right? So they have all their processes written down. They know uh, when, they, when they, they do a decision, they write that down. If they do a meeting, they wrap up five minutes before the end of the meeting and write all the tasks down, meet again the next day. Very organized teams. At the same time, you have very unstructured teams, right? People that are just writing stuff on the whiteboard, wiping it out again. Um, their, their meetings always run over. They had heated discussion in the hallways. Those unstructured teams. Guess what? Both teams can kick ass. Um, Google has run, run a project uh, investigating in teams, finding what is the difference between normal performance teams and high performance teams called Project Aristotle. And they found out that this is not an indicator for the high performance teams. Teams can be high performance. Organized teams and unstructured teams can both be high performance. So, different kind of teams. We have different kind of teams. And then, at the same time, we have different kind of projects, right? So, if you're writing software for a Mars landing mission, you need, you need to totally approach. You cannot just shoot a rocket each week to the Mars. So, your, your approach to write those software, to test those software, is totally different than when you write a software maybe for, for a dog tracking app. That's a real thing. In, um, I've been living in the Silicon Valley for, for quite some time. Uh, and that's a real thing. People uh, can track their dogs when they're out with the dog walkers, um, can track their dogs on a mobile app, um, and can see where, where the dogs took a poop. Um, that's a real thing, people developing these apps. And, but what I want to say is you, know that you need a totally different approach to write those apps than a mass landing app, because you can update the software immediately, uh, Put, put, push new, new updates out uh, and, and, and get feedback from your customers immediately. So you have different teams and different kind of projects, right? So you have these two things. But then I see organizations saying, OK, but we're approaching it with, a, with the same process. It's the same process for, for the whole organization. Or we, we just take everything must be scrum here. Is that really something that, that works? Different projects, different teams? Doesn't sound right for me. Um, I've been working with a, with a lot of uh, projects in my career, uh, and a project never, never looks like this. It's not like, okay, we have milestone one, milestone two, check, 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 and we're done. Great. It's never working like this. Um, also, this year, that's a, that's a quite easy way of, of, of uh, showing a, a software project. It's also an ideal thing to do, but... It's never like we're, we're running two-week cycles or three-week cycles. After the cycle, we find out, OK, we ran for three weeks in the wrong direction. I already knew it, but I had to wait until the retrospect. It's just not working also like this. In real time, software projects, looks, it's, it's much more unpredictable. Um, it's, it's, it's more looking like this. OK, we have, we have a problem here. We have to fix that. And actually, we encouraged uh, our teams at Atlassian uh, to run projects like, like this. We put the right team structure in place, so we have cross-functional teams, we empower the teams to make the decision and say, okay, go, find your way. And then at the same time, what we found out that these, these teams, 
they they developed some methods to overcome these hurdles that they had in this in, in projects. So, for example, one team was actually uh, find, finding out that they were uh, not, not aligning with the leadership team. So what they did is they came up, okay, let's do a demo trust. They called it a demo trust. It was just a regular meeting, half an hour each week with the leadership team to align the project team with the leadership team. Um, and, and, and then they told the team next door, we are doing a demo trust. And it spread it like a wildfire over the whole JIRA teams. Everyone was doing demo trust all of a sudden. And all these small things, um, we collected at Alassia. We said, okay, we, let's, let's write that down. That's great. Why doesn't the Jira team just doing it? Why not the Confluence team, right? So we collected all these small things that we saw, matured them, and then put them in a, in a so-called team playbook. That's the team playbook. And over time, the team playbook get more, much, get more mature and more mature over time. Um, so we said, okay, great. It looks, it looks great. It's, it's, it's fine. It's helping us a ton to run our, our feature development, our projects. So why don't we give it to the world? That's what we did. So you can go to atlassianteamplaybook.com and just see what the plays are, are about. Um, so we actually released 26 plays already. Uh, and there's, there are plays that uh, are, are coming to, to the team playbook um, on a regular basis. So, now you know how Atlassian came up with the idea of a team playbook. But what is it now? What are these plays? So, I brought five, five plays with me here to DevOps, uh, and I will show you five plays to explain a little bit what is inside the team playbook and how, you, how it helps your team to overcome some hurdles. Um, and the first play, actually, is, is, is something... Uh, fixes a problem or tries to fix a problem that actually every team I've been working with has. Uh, and that is setting priorities. Who has a uh, problem setting priorities here? Yeah, almost, almost everybody here. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, we haven't figured it out, but we have a way where we're trying to solve this thing. Um, everyone knows, if we, if we want to set priorities, we ask around, what, what, what should we do? And then the designers, of course, says, yeah, we need to, ex to, we, we to, we to improve the user experience. The user experience is not good for our product, so we need to improve that. Then um, the management comes and says, yeah, we had just had this meeting, you know, Project X. That's the most important project that we have. We should totally do Project X, and uh, please put that at the highest priority on your list. And then the developers comes and said, oh, before we actually enhance the user experience, the whole front-end technology is just not, not good enough. Uh, we, have to, we have to find a new, better front-end technology first before we work on the user experience. And then, of course, what the salespeople comes. And the salespeople always say, oh, wait, 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 wait. We have this small little custom feature that we have to build into the software. Uh, and we really have to build it because we have already sold it to the customer, so please put that in in the next month. Um, okay, comes to the list, and then our list is done. Until the management comes again and says, we just had a management meeting and now Project Z and Y are the most important projects. And now we have our priority list. Well, guess what? Uh, what, we, what, 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 what a play does here called OKRs is setting, setting the, the big goals for, for a quarter. Um, OKRs is a play in the team playbook and OKRs is nothing that Atlassian has invented. Actually, it helped Intel to develop the 8086 microprocessor. At that time, Motorola was, uh, was, was, was way ahead of Intel in the microprocessor business. And Intel said, okay, we have to do something. We have to concentrate everything onto this, this new microprocessor, this 8086 microprocessor. So we write down OKRs to focus on it. And 60 months later, actually, they were winning the game against Motorola. Motorola couldn't react that fast. Um, in, in that game, so they, they got out of the market uh, for, for, for running the best microcontroller and Intel won that game, just due to OKRs. Uh, Intel is not the only company uh, that is running OKRs. Also, these products wouldn't have been so focused, so, so good, uh, if Google wasn't, wasn't doing OKRs. So the whole Google organization is running OKRs, uh, setting their goals with, with OKRs. So what, what are these OKRs now? Um, so, it's an acronym, and it stands for objectives on one side and key results on the other side. 
So you set, you set your big, big, big goals into objectives. Objectives set the direction. This is where you want to head to. This is a little bit what, like what, is, what, is, what, what guides us for the next three months. Um, it's really the big things, not the small little task. You have to do them anyway. Uh, they're coming up anyway. Bugs come in. You have to fix those. But these are the big tasks we are looking for. Um, it always should describe an outcome for the customer. It should always be something that relates to an outcome to the customer. And limit the scope. You cannot work on everything. Just limit it and say the next three months we're working on these two or three big things. These are our big things for the next three months. And then you define key results for these OKRs. And key results are defining the outcome. What should, what should come out at the end? Um, so it, one to three key results per OKR, and it's really a measurable thing, something that you can measure. Please avoid binary key results like, yeah, we did it, or we didn't do it. Uh, should be really something like a number that you can measure at the end and say, yeah, we hit the 300,000 page views or something like that. Um, and it should be ambitious, something that stretches you, something that is really something that you say, if everything goes well, if everything is fine and, and we, we run in the right direction, we have the right people, we have the right resources, great, we can reach that goal. Something that really, really stretches you. So let's, let's have, a, have an example here. Let's, let's uh, say the Jira team has, has the goal that people can skim faster through the backlog. You know, in Jira, there's this, this backlog thing where you can skim through the backlog. So this could be an OKR, an objective. And a key result could be that uh, the loading time should be way faster, should be 80% faster for 10,000 items on our test server. Um, this could be one key result. Another key result could be that uh, you group this, 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 the backlog items. I don't know. Um, but this, let's say this is the key result. And then at the end of the quarter, when you have set these key results, uh, set these OKRs, you're looking at what is the result? Where are we now? Uh, and then you find out uh, we just reduced the loading speed by 64%. So we have a scoring of 0 0.8. Your score is always from 0 to 1. So 1 is 100%, 0 0.8 is 80%. So 80% we reached, damn, we didn't reach the goal, which is not true. Google came up with the scale and said, okay, 1.0 is mind blown. Remember, I said, it's really the ambitious goal. Really, if you stretch, if you stretch for more, you can reach 1.0. Uh, zero, and everything uh, until 0 0.7 is totally fine, is great, its goal is, is, is reached. If you have just 1.0s in your key results, well, you did it, you did it wrong because it was not, it, it, it didn't stretch you. You cannot have 1.0s everywhere. It's not possible. Um, then your, your, your goals were too low. Your key results were too low. Um, everything between 0 0.7, uh, 0, 0 0.7 and uh, 0, 0 0.0, well, it's okay. It's, yeah, it's, it's a result. What can we do? Uh, but we have to look into what we can learn it for, the, for the next OKR session or for the, 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 the next cycle. Um, as I said, these key results are quarterly, but you don't just define them once. You look, you look at it, yeah, you define them once and then look at it again after, after a quarter. You do monthly check-ins. So you, you, you make forecasts. You say, okay, now one month into the game, our forecast is 1.0, two months into the game, oh, it doesn't look good, I don't think we can reach it, 0.6, and then you do the final score. Um, also important for these, these OKRs is that they are transparent. So uh, at Alassian, we, we have put everything on, on, on a Confluence page and share it with everyone. So, so we have opened up the page so everyone can see the goals from every team, even from the leadership team. So these OKRs are, are in the open, so we can really see what are the goals for, for each team, what is the goal, goal for, the, for the management team, what is the goal for the marketing team, what is the goal for the JIRA, uh, for, for the JIRA teams. And then we can, we can also say, oh wow, these goals align or these goals clash, so we, we have to adjust those. So it's, it's, everything is up in the open. Now, I've told you now for, I don't know, five, six, seven minutes what OKRs are, are, how great these things are. Now go and do OKRs, right? It's a little bit like showing you this dish, let's taste it to you and say, and now cook it. It's, 
it's hard, right? You cannot, uh, you say, oh, wow, I'm, a, I'm, not a, I'm not a chef. How should I cook it? Well, but guess what? There are chefs that have written down a great recipe how to cook, cook this, this, this dish, right? And this is also how the team playbook works. Um, we have written down the, the plays as recipes. So you can just follow those recipes and try to, try to run those plays in the team playbook. Um, so as you see here, there's an overview how to run this play, how many people do you need, how difficult it is. OKRs are quite hard um, and, and, and needs a lot, uh, a lot of time, a lot of prep time, a lot of run time. Um, but then also you have the ingredients here. What, what do we need for this? Uh, and then it's like, like a recipe. You have a step-by-step -step guide with some pro tips. Um, and some anti-patterns here. So it guides you through the whole OKR's finding session and running session and at the end, wrapping up session. Um, so this, is, this was one play. Um, the next play is, is about aligning the team. Let's assume my boss comes to me and says, Sven, you know what? We got the budget. I say, oh, great, we got the budget for FeatureX. I can build FeatureX. So you can build FeatureX. And I say, oh, great, yeah. I always wanted to, to build FeatureX++ plus plus, uh, because I have some additions to it because I, I really like that. So I go to my team then and say, hey, well, you know what? FeatureX++ plus plus is, a, is a great next thing that we built. Uh, and and one, of my, my, one of my teammates says, oh, great. I love Feature A. I say, oh, Feature A? And one says, whoa, no, Feature B is terrible. Well, guess what? We, we have a problem here. Our, uh, we, we don't have the same idea what feature X++, feature B, feature X is, right? And this really happened also in, real, in, the, in the real world. Um, we had two teams at Atlassian. They were, were uh, not co-located, they were distributed, so they were did two different locations, uh, which wasn't really the problem. They met regularly, um, but, and then also they did their, their daily stand-ups. They were in the same, same time zone, so they did their daily stand-ups through video calls, um, had, had, had Jira issues and, and OKR sets. So I, uh, normally everything was, was set up right to make, to make them successful. But what we saw is they didn't get anything done. There were endless discussions around this and that, and they were hating it. They were hating the project. They were hating each other. So really, really bad. So what we did is actually we said, OK, let's, let's get together and talk about it. So we brought these two teams together in one location and said, hey, let's, let's talk about it. Um, what do you think the goal is for, for your project that we are running? And one team said, oh, yeah, clear. It's, it's improving the performance. The performance uh, of Confluence needs to be improved of the editor. And the other team said, well, wait. It's about customer growth. We want to have more customer on our, on our platform, right? That's, that's the goal of, of, of this project. It's like totally clear to us that their goals weren't really aligned. They didn't have the same goal in mind. And that doesn't really work out because they were both running in, in, the, in different direction and they were just fighting to each other. Um, so we have a play in the playbook that calls Project Poster. It's very, very simple. It's just writing everything down. What is the goal and how do we solve the problem? Um, it's a template, actually, uh, where we talk about the problem, the real problem that, that we want to solve, right? It's not like talking features or something. It's just talking about the problem. Why do we want to solve that? What is the validation data that this problem really exists? And what are possible solutions? Believe me, I've run a lot of projects. And this is not what everyone does. Validation data. Where's the validation data? It's not, not, not there for, for most of the projects. So everyone has to fill out, or every team that is running a project has to fill out this project poster. It's a simple template, uh, quite, quite simple, but it has matured over time, and we have put everything in it uh, to make sure that the teams are aligned, that we, that, that we write down what this project is about. Of course, it's not a poster. It lives in, in Confluence, so we can share it with, with, with everyone um, and write everything, everything down. I actually introduced in, my, in, in the new company for our working in, I introduced Project Poster because I felt also this team didn't know really what, what is the real goal of this project and also had a, a bigger scope in mind 
And they said, we, we can never, this project will never be done. But then we wrote down, sat down, wrote this project poster and really limit also the scope in this project poster. It's a, it's a simple technique, but a very, very powerful thing. So as I said, um, it's a living document. You can see here, these things are already done, but not everything is figured out at the beginning. So not after you're running your first project poster session, you have figured everything out. That's not, that's not the case. So you've, you, you've, you uh, investigate and, and uh, fill, fill this project poster out over time. So people can also watch it, follow it, uh, and see how it evolves over time. Here, here for example, uh, the validation data, uh, that's, that's, not, that's not ready. We have to work on that um, in that example here. What, what does it bring? Well, it brings the team alignment. Everyone is running in the right direction. If there's a discussion and said, well, let's try this, then you can say, no, wait, look at, look at our project poster. Look at what our goals are for this project. Pretty important. Um, on the other thing, keep it, it's, it's always up to date. So what you can do is if new people come in and want to find out about your project, you can just say, okay, point it, point it to the project poster. It's up to date, it's, it's the new, new stuff is in there. That's really important that you have to keep, keep those project poster alive. It's a living document. So uh, keep, keep the project poster alive so it's always up to date, it's never outdated. Um, do that in your daily stand-ups or in a weekly meeting. Um, all right, um, alignment, team alignment, great, good. Um, Let's, let's show you another play. And this play is around taking decisions. And I want to start with, with uh, some, some, some employer from, employ, uh, some, some employee from, from Atlassian. This person here. Uh, you probably don't know this person. It's a head of design, Jürgen Spangl from Atlassian. But you probably know this person here, right? Uh, Steve Jobs. So what do these persons have in common? Well, at the last conference I asked this, they have, someone said, oh, they both have a clicker in their hand. Yeah, that's true, but that's not, that's not, that's not the thing here. Um, so what, what does these per persons have in common? Well, you know what? They're wearing both black shirts and, and the jeans, right? But not only that they wear this on stage, this black shirt and the jeans. They wear the same outfit every day. If you come to the Alassian office in Sydney, you see Jürgen having a black shirt, in winter time or in our summer time, uh, he's, 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 he's wearing uh, uh, jeans and in, in, in the summertime he's wearing shorts. That's just what he switches out. But you can see Jürgen just in black shirt uh, and, and, and shorts or jeans. And now, this is Mark Zuckerberg's wardrobe, right? So you see dark, dark, uh, dark gray hoodie and gray shirt. This is what he wears every day. Why does this leadership people, why, why these, these leaders, why do they do that, right? Why, why are they doing that? Why are they wearing the same stuff every day? Because research has shown that we have a limited number of good decisions per day. So they want, don't want to waste their decisions in the morning and take, take, take something out of the wardrobe and decide what they want to take. They take the same thing every day, so they don't want to waste their decisions. Um, if, if you work in a company where it's, it's a very decision-driven management culture, let's, let's assume that, well, uh, guess what? When, when your boss has to make all the decisions, you go with all small decisions to your, to your manager, to your boss, go in the morning, right? Because you know then there are some good decisions left. Don't do it in the afternoon. It's just not, not no good decision anymore. Um, talking about decisions, right? Talking about decisions here. Um, there is this thing called a decisions tree, where you can, it's a mental model for decisions, where you can, can uh, identify where your decision is, in, 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 if it's something that is uh, really something that you can take or that the team have to take. So there are relief decisions, they say. So relief decisions are those decisions that actually uh, have no real risk uh, this is, these are daily decisions that you take on a daily basis. Then there are branch decisions. Branch decisions uh, have some risks in it, but it can be mitigated. So you can turn it back. Uh, you, if, if, if you really need to turn, turn the decision, turn it back, you can do that. And then there are the big trunk decisions, the organizational decisions that you say, okay, we can just go into that direction or that direction. We have to take the decision down. And it's really hard to turn that decision over again. So, 
What about leave decisions? Well, leave decisions are these decisions that you decide. You decide it on your own. You don't have to involve anyone. Um, maybe you have to document it somewhere, but you don't have to involve anyone. Then there are the branch decisions where you say, ah, oh, maybe I ask some people about their opinions. Uh, this is where the team needs to decide something. This is normally on project level or something like that. Um, so the team can, can, can decide you have a team meeting or whatever, or you bring that up, uh, and then the team can decide. But what about the big decisions that normally stops your project? Because no one, you, you don't know who should take the decisions. Well, guess what? There's a play for it. It calls it DAISY. And a DAISY stands for, DAISY is an acronym, um, and DAISY stands for uh, A, approver. So you have one approver, you define one approver, the person that approves your decision. Then you have D, like a driver, someone that drives your decision forward. That is probably you, if you want to have that decision made, it's probably you, you are the driver. Um, and then you have the contributors, people that have stake in the game, that depend on the decision, that have maybe something influence on the decision and it influences their daily work. Um, and then you have the, those, which is pretty important, those that just need to be informed. They also have opinions, but you don't listen to them because they just need to be informed, right? These are just the people that have to know that you have taken the decision and run into this direction. Um, so we call it a DAISY, uh, and as I said, one approver, just one approver, one driver, then you have a bunch of contributors and the people that needs to be informed. So we, we actually uh, needed, we are running, uh, at last time we're running uh, constantly these daisies. This is, this is something that we uh, do twice a week or something. So you might have heard that the Trello team uh, actually released an app for Windows and for, for Mac. So you could have a Trello app, you can download it, uh, and that's actually just a web view, so you can see uh, the, 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 the Trello board in a, in a nice desktop app. And then there are some additional features to those app, right, where you can switch easily boards, uh, you can uh, have, sh have keyboard shortcuts for adding cards and stuff like that, that uh, is not possible with, with the web software. Um, so, but the question was, we were introducing that to the world, what should we do with the app now? Should we, should we further develop that or should we put that in maintenance mode or should we just uh, put the last backlog features in it? So we actually defined here uh, a DAISY. So we want to run a DAISY where we have the driver contributors informed. The good thing is that we put it on a Confluence page that we just have to mention those people. So those people get a notification and they, they just go into, in, onto that page uh, and see that there is a decision that has to be taken. Right, um, And then, of course, all the options are written down, the pros and cons, uh, and then you just go as a driver, you hear everyone, you implement that, you, you, you get everyone's opinion, and then you go to the approver and take the decision. Then the, the team, as a team, you take the decision and then you just need to be approved. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty simple framework, actually, if, if, you, if you think about it, but it's a framework to get actually everyone aligned to take the decision. Everyone is aligned and everyone can see, okay, I have heard about it. Uh, it's, it's, it's made in a transparent way. Uh, everyone can see it. Everyone that needs to be informed is also mentioned on the page. So everyone knows that this decision has, has, has uh, been taken. Um, and it's actually easy that way to drive the decision forward, to drive it in a timely manner. All right, um, so these are daisies. That was play number three. Two plays left, um, and the next play is actually uh, about retrospectives. Retrospectives are a great instrument. Retrospectives are great if you wanna wanna learn from the past. So think that you did wrong in the past, you take into the retrospective, or did good in the past too, um, you take it into a, a retro retrospective, talk about it, and then you improve. The, for um, improve stuff for the next cycle or for the next project or for the next iteration whenever you run a retrospective. But then, actually, it's too late, right? You, you, did, you did something wrong in the past, and if you improve it in the, in the future, it's actually too late for the, for the last cycle or for the last project. Wouldn't it be great if we can fix things actually before they happen. That would be great, right? So I'm, I'm a kid of the 80s. Um, 
grew up in the 80s and I loved a movie called Back to the Future. And I always wanted to have this DeLorean to travel back in time, right? Uh, and fix things in the, in the past. Just fix the last iteration. Just do a, get, get a DeLorean. Um, or fix the, the last project. So what you can do then, uh, if, you, if you travel back in the past, you can just say, okay, I can take different decisions here. Uh, that was a wrong decision. I, can, I, I, I should, should have taken a different decision here. Oh, these extra steps here, right? This, it can take a shortcut here. This was a kind of, kind of extra steps that I could skip, actually, if I knew, if I would have knew know it before. Um, Guess what? Uh, there's no play actually that brings you a DeLorean, would be great, uh, and that, that, that you can travel in the past, unfortunately. But what you can do is actually you can travel into the future. And there's a play in the playbook called a pre-mortem. So you can run something and look into the future and see how does our product will look into in the future. That's a play in the team playbook. And I go, go with you through a step-by-step -by -step guide how to run those play. So first, you need to prepare the, the, the team. Um, you have to set the stage. You have to say, okay, good. What could think about before you come into, into this meeting? What could actually happen? Hey, what, think about what can slow us down? What do you see right now? What can slow us down? It's amazing. It's in people's head already that they know what can slow us down. We just have to get it out and discuss it. Um, what makes us actually nervous when we, when we think about launching the product? Uh, and what, what could stop us, actually? What could hold us back? Um, so think about these things. And then you invite everyone into a pre-mortem uh, meeting and say, set the stage. So think it's March 2019. Uh, we just launched the, this cool new product. Uh, so what is now? How does the product look like? What features does the product have? What problems does the product have? Then you divide the, the group in two, two groups. One that is a success group and say, oh yeah, we did a great job. Everything is fine. These features are all rocking, rocking the customer. And then you have the other group where you say, oh, this wasn't really, really good here. So we, we failed here and there and we couldn't deliver on this. Um, and then you have these two groups and, and let's write those, those things down. Uh, of course, you want to have uh, everyone's opinion about success and failure, so you exchange the sheets, sheets and then write, everyone writes, writes the other stuff down. Um, and then you rank those things and say, oh, this could actually potentially really happen, uh, or, or this, this is really great, we should amplify on that. Um, and then you should vote and make a plan. So take the top three things that you think would happen, could happen, um, and then make change change the plan. Pretty amazing. Uh, we have seen people come out, come go into pre-mortems that they, this project is is so good in such a good shape, and went out of the of the uh, pre-mortem and were pretty miserable and weren't seen all the signs that this project project will probably fail. Um, so it's it's a it's a pretty amazing thing if you run a pre-mortem. I can just encourage you to do that. Now, I said there's 26 plays in the team playbook. That's a lot of plays, right? Um, you shouldn't use all the plays, right? You shouldn't, shouldn't do that. Don't do that. Uh, just pick those plays that your team needs. Um, just an example here. We had the, uh, I don't know if you heard about Confluence Collaborative Editing. There was a team that was doing that um, a few years ago, two years after... Our, our co-founder announced it on stage that we were working on it. Uh, actually, the, the product were nowhere. Um, three years after that, uh, we, we actually had a few product, two product managers and uh, one dev manager left. Uh, so we already had two product managers and two dev managers. And then actually four years, uh, the project didn't run anywhere. Uh, we had four product managers and actually three designers uh, burned through the project. The pro the, uh, you know, there was a lot of frustration in the team. The team was totally frustrating. They weren't going anywhere. Um, so what they did is actually they looked at it. What's, what's wrong here? So the first thing they did, they ran a project poster just to align the goals because they didn't have an alignment in the team, a clear understanding how success will look like. What, what, what is the scope? So they were pretty happy running this project poster and to limit, limit the scope of the project. Um, the next thing they did, they ran a couple of daisies because 
it's not, and it was not about that the decision was just lying around and no one wanted to take those decisions. That was one problem. The other problem is that the people weren't discussing those, those, uh, those decisions or those options that they had. And this, this discussions really, that was something that the team really got fired up and said, oh, whoa, this is great. Let's have a discussion around, around this. Um, and then the last thing they did was they were running a pre-mortem. Um, half a year before they launched, they found out in the pre-mortem that they were, uh, they were missing analytics. So they don't have any analytics. They wouldn't have launched without any idea how collaborative editing would have been used by customers. So they were putting analytics in and uh, actually half a year later, they launched the first beater. Uh, totally successful, great, and they could see how the customer could interact. They had analytics in there, uh, and the team was was much happier after they run this few plays, limit the scope, run a premortem, and had taken the decisions. So this this uh, playbook helped them a lot with their project. Now, we are we are here. We are we're writing software, right? Um, we are we are all software developers. We're writing a bunch of code. How do we test those code? Well, we have automatic, automatic tests in place. We make sure the quality are up to our standards, the functionality is automatically tested, software is great. But what about the people that produce the software? You. In which shape are you? What's, what's, how, how good are you right now? Um, how, do you, how do you test your team? Are there team tests? Yeah, so. Last play in the team playbook is a team health monitor. So you could run a health monitor with your team. Um, and this is really something that is a diagnosis for, for your team, just, just a health for your team. Um, see how, how good your team is. Uh, and we, over time, have developed eight checkpoints for, for uh, project teams um, to, to see if, the, if your team is healthy. Um, these are just for project teams. There's also a team health monitor for support teams and a team's health, team health monitor for leadership teams. Um, but these are the ones that are for, for project teams. So first question is, does the project have a full-time owner? Can you say yes, no, maybe? Um, do we have a balanced team? Do we have the right people inside the team? Are the right people in the team? Um, do we know that? Uh, do we have a shared understanding what our goals are? Do we know what, 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 what our goals are? Do we know what, what, where we're heading to? Um, do we have values and metrics in place? Do we, can we measure our success? Do we know how success look like? Can we measure that? Um, do we have a proof of concept? Does that really work, what we're working on for half a year? Is that really something that works? Do we have a proof of, of we're running in the right direction? Um, do we have a one-pager, something that... Uh, People have written down about the project, about the goals, about, about what we do want to do, what we want to reach, uh, about the time that, that this needs. Have we figured out all dependencies? Do we, do we need the legal team maybe for, for this project, some GDPR things? Um, do we know that? Or does, does, the, does the legal team know that they need to get, get involved? Um, and the last thing is, what about, what about the velocity? How fast are, are, we, are, we, are we doing things? Uh, are we improving? Are we getting slower? Uh, do we know that? So these are the eight checkpoints for project teams that you run through. And it's a pretty simple thing. You just say, hey, do we have a full-time owner? And then get the team say, yeah, I think we have a full-time owner. Or no, I don't think I have a full-time owner. Or do you think our team is balanced? And then you say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or no, no. Uh, and then you just uh, talk about it. And, and, and get to an agreement um, if it's red, yellow, or green. If this item is yet red, yellow, or green. You can run health monitors just uh, on, on, on pure whiteboards if you want. Um, there's also possibility that you run that in Confluence so, and document everything there. The Trello team actually, of course, they use Trello. The Trello team is a pretty much a distributed teams, a lot of remote teams. Um, there's a talk tomorrow. Uh, from, from, from someone from Trello that talks about how they do remote work in uh, Trello. Um, and what they do is in a video, video call, they're putting up a Trello board and say, okay, let's vote. Do we have a full-time owner? And then adding the cards uh, live to the board. Um, and 
and then they're filling out the whole board and have a discussion around that. Or what you also can do is you, we have these card sets and I brought a few with me here. Uh, you can, after the talk, just grab one. Um, it's probably not uh, one for everyone here, but first come, first serve. Um, so we, uh, this card sets and it's working, working like this planning poker, uh, red, yellow, green, just vote for it. And then you write those, those votes down. And you should look at it over time and, and see how you evolve or where you get better or worse uh, and, and, and then work on these things. Um, so this is, this is transparent and clear. So Team Health Monitor, great for the diagnosis. But if you find out that you haven't got a balanced team, what can you do? What can you do? Well, guess what? You got already the medicine. The medicine is the place. So you can look in the team playbook and see what helps uh, to overcome this, 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 this hurdle. Um, so there's a bunch of recommendations. If you have problems with, with a balanced team, do a DAISY or roles and responsibility play. Um, you can look it up. Um, but now you're not Atlassian, right? You, you, you've seen all this place. Atlassian has come up with this place. But as I said, you're, you're a different team. You work in different organizations. You're not Atlassian. But I'm pretty sure you're doing small things inside your team come up with small things inside your team uh, that helps you in your daily work, in your project work, in your product development work. Um, but that is maybe not spread to other teams. Um, and this is what, what I encourage you to do. If you want to work with a team playbook, don't just take the, the place from, from Atlassian. Just look at your own organization, see what works there. Adjust the place from Atlassian. And then build your, your companies, your own team playbook. Why should you do it? As I said, we have different teams, different projects, and we shouldn't have the same process. Things are different, and we should admit that. Don't get me wrong. I don't, I don't say per se that processes are just bad and we have to reinvent everything uh, every time. I'm flying back to Hamburg tomorrow, and I don't want to have my pilot coming up with new stuff during takeoff or landing. He should stick to the process, right? He should, he should just stick to the plan. I don't want, want him to experiment or uh, come up with a, with a new play uh, with the team. No, don't do that. Um, uh, if, if we look at uh, software development, if we have an incident and we need to respond to the incident, there should be some process in place how we respond to incident if it's a public, public uh, service that we, that we have. So having an incident handbook is, is pretty much uh, a good thing to know this is the, the workflow for, for the process for, uh, that Atlassian has for, for incident responses. Um, so having a plan there is great. Processes are actually great if you want to assure a certain quality. For example, if you want to uh, assure uh, 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 your code quality, um, maybe a, a, a process could be to review every line of code that has been checked into the repository. Um, that, that would be good. So if you want to do things right, processes are great. But running projects is not about doing things right. Running projects is about, or developing uh, products is about doing the right things. And what it needs for that is adaptability. You need to react to, uh, fast to situations that comes up in, in projects or in software development. You need to react fast. Uh, and, and that's where the team playbook can help. The teams are different, as I said, the projects are different, and the problems that we're solving are also different. Um, what I encourage you to do is identify the problem. This is probably the hardest thing, right? This is the hardest thing to identify, say, and admit also, you know what, we have a problem here. We should involve the customer and do customer interviews or something. That's another play in the playbook. You should admit that you have a problem. That's probably the hardest thing. Then try to find something that helps overcome those hurdles. It could be a play, a method, whatever. Just, just find something that overcomes the hurdle, work on it, and then try to solve it. Um, no, no, try not to, to wait until someone comes up with a big Big process to solve your problems. Solve your problems yourself. Or as the co-founder, Mike Cannon Brooks from Atlassian said, now go and get shit done. Thank you very much.